Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This is episode number 11 of the Diverse Places revision series over here on my channel. Today we're going to be looking at managing cultural and demographic issues. So please do subscribe down below if you think this is useful for you. I upload one of these every Monday at 4.30pm going through the whole A-level geography specification. So if you haven't seen the rest of the videos there's playlists and playlists of them on my channel already so go ahead find them. And without further ado, let's just get straight on into this. Cities as unequal spaces. Although their bright lights lure many people from a wide range of backgrounds, large cities are actually very unequal places. Rich and poor live in close proximity, but lead very different lives. Income inequalities exist in all major urban areas, although there are exceptions such as Tokyo. The general relationship nonetheless, that the bigger the city, the greater the inequality. Inequality is measured using an indicator known as the Gini Index. It measures how far income distribution within a country deviates from perfect equality. An index rating of 0% is perfect equality, and a rating of 100% is perfect inequality. The larger the percentage, the greater the concentration of wealth among a few. Inequality in London. London is far from being the, world, the world's most unequal city with a Gini value of about 45, 43%. But inequality is certainly present there, and it's growing. In 2011, the London School of Economics published a report into London's poverty. It showed that of all 12 standard UK economic regions, London had the highest proportion of household in the top 10% of incomes, but also the highest proportion in the bottom 10%. Inequality in London grew during the economic boom between 1997 and 2008, when the incomes of its wealthiest residents grew, but London's overall poverty level remained unchanged. As London has become more diverse, so its inequality has increased. This is due to three factors. Economic activity among different ethnic groups, low pay and housing costs. Economic activity and ethnicity. Most people earn their income through employment, so economic activity can, is a cause of poverty, whether through unemployment, disability or being a student. Although most international migrants to the UK are economic, the employment level varies between different ethnic groups. For example, in 2011, women in Bangladeshi and Pakistani families had the highest levels of economic inactivity among all adults because of their traditional family roles. Poverty and low pay. Low pay is also important as a cause of poverty in certain types of, in certain types of, of employment. 37% of employed men worked in low skilled, low pay occupations in 2011. However, this percentage was higher among certain ethnic groups. 50% of men of Pakistani, Black African and Bangladeshi ethnicity work in such jobs such as in restaurants and hotels. 59% of employed women were in low skilled jobs in 2011, particularly Bangladeshi which 67% and Caribbean 66% who were commonly employed in the NHS and social care. Lower income households are therefore more likely to contain people from certain ethnic backgrounds about 40% of people from ethnic minorities live in low income households, which is twice the poverty rate of, the Briti of white British people. Only 10% of white British people are in low income employment. The percentage rises to 65% Bangladeshis, 50% Pakistanis and 30% Black Africans. Poverty and housing costs. Although average incomes in London are higher than the rest of the UK, poverty has increased largely due to the high cost of housing. Between 1995 and 2015, general inflation in the UK rose by 73%, but house prices in London rose up to 1,000%. Households in London now spend up to 60% of their income on housing, compared with the UK average of 25%. After housing, costs are deducted. Inner London now has the UK's highest poverty rate. Many people can no longer afford to live in areas of London. This situation worsened since 2010, 
due to government cuts to housing benefits, which particularly affects low-income households and therefore more ethnic minorities. Tackling inequality. Since the 1980s, the UK government has increasingly used regeneration projects to deliver improvement in wealth. The theory is that they create jobs, both in the initial building work and then in secondary jobs, as more people are attracted to the regenerated area. In theory, therefore, regenerated areas should see increasing incomes and falling inequality. This should be the case in the three East London boroughs of Barking and Dagenham, Newham and Tower Hamlets, which have shown historically high levels of deprivation and which have been through the Docklands regeneration and also the regeneration necessary to host the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. As a result, there should be obvious improvements to incomes, deprivation and health in these boroughs. All three of these boroughs have undergone regeneration at different times in the recent years with mixed results. Barking and Dagenham. Until recently, this was one of London's biggest manufacturing boroughs, until Ford Motor Vehicles and Sanofi, the large pharmaceutical company, closed many of their production facilities there. Regeneration is now taking place, mainly to deliver housing on industrial brownfield sites. Tower Hamlets remains one of London's poorest boroughs, in spite of the fact that it contains Canary Wharf. Most of those working in Canary Wharf live outside the area and the redevelopment has generated few local jobs. Newham hosted the 2012 Olympic Games and contains most of the new Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. It also contains the new Westfield Shopping Centre which generated 10,000 jobs. However, most of the construction work was completed by 2011 and retail jobs tended to be part-time, seasonal and low paid. Levels of deprivation and health indicators. Although East London remains London's most deprived area, there has been a reduction in deprivation levels between 2010 and 2015. Health indicators are yet to follow this pattern. It therefore seems as if regeneration has brought some success. However, deprivation data could be treated with caution. In 2010, the UK and London in particular was recovering from a financial banking crisis Economic improvements w had begun and were maintained, so deprivation would have been expected to fall between 2010 and 2015 anyway. Unemployment fell nationally in the same period and is one of the many indicators by which deprivation is measured. Many health indicators were not linked to regeneration, but to targets in the NHS, such as diagnosing and treating cancer. These would count as reductions in deprivation, but would not be due to regeneration. The assimilation of different cultures. Although London is extremely diverse, the degree to which different ethnic groups become assimilated varies considerably. One of the ways in which cultural assimilation can be measured is by measuring voter turnout during elections. Historically, general elections have had higher turnouts than local elections. Nationally, for example, there was a 66.1% turnout in the 2015 general election, but only about 30% for local elections. Ethnicity and deprivation affect voting behaviour. To quote the news website, East London Lines, the poor don't vote. However, ethnicity can sometimes actually increase the likelihood of voting. Ed Fieldhouse, professor, of Manche professor at Manchester University, found that voting in the 2001 general election was greater within East London's Bangladeshi community than amongst Londoners as a whole, even though the area was poorer. He believes that people vote when they face prejudice or, explo or exploitation at work and that traditions of community organisations have transferred there from Bangladesh. Community engagement. Crime has fallen across London almost every year since 2000, which makes it amongst the world's safest global cities. However, people are still targeted with hate crimes because of who they are or who they are perceived to have been. One particular target has been the Muslim community in London, which has tried to respond and improve community relations. Tower Hamlets contains the UK's largest Muslim community and it holds community open days, an initiative encouraged by the Muslim Council of Britain, so that people of other faiths can see a mosque and understand its part in Muslim life. And that is the end of episode 11. I hope you learned something. I hope you're taking something away. Please do subscribe down below if you think that this was helpful as I'm uploading the next video, same time, same place next week. 
Monday at 4.30pm and I will see you there. Bye guys.